Okay, this pod is about food, so now we move from meat to fruit. Your next speaker is Sam Van Aken. Part art installation, part gardening, part conservation. Sam Van Aken one day had a strange thought, a Catholic thought. And the result is an amazing tree that gives 40 fruit. Sam. Thank you very much. <laughs> How are you? Pleasure. Okay, uh, so the tree of 40 fruit is a single tree that grows over 40 different varieties of stone fruits, including peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, cherries, and almonds. Throughout the majority of the year, it appears like a normal-looking tree, until spring when it blossoms in variegated tones of pink and white and crimson. First and foremost, the Tree of Forty Fruit is an artwork. But as the project has evolved, it's grown to touch upon issues relating to industrial agriculture, food security, genetic diversity, climate change, and even religion. And so the project started from two sort of fascinations. And the first fascination was with the hoax. I was interested in making an artwork that had no form, that functioned almost like a rumor. That ultimately led me to the 1938 War of the Worlds broadcast by Orson Welles. So I purchased my own portable radio unit, and I began staging my own hoaxes by hijacking, I shouldn't say hijacking, I should say by going on to FM frequencies. Um, and the problem with that is that in the US, we have a thing called the FCC, and they frown upon that type of behavior. So it wasn't really an artwork that had much longevity to it. And so I went back and I looked at the idea of a hoax. And I found out that the term hoax comes from hocus pocus, which in turn comes from a line in the Catholic Eucharist that says, hoc est enum corpus meum. And it's the point at which the priest says, this is my body over the bread, and transforms it into the body of Christ. Now, I have an art background, and I'm a sculptor, and you really want to know how to do that. That process is known as transubstantiation, and it's where the appearance of a thing remains the same, but its reality changes. And I thought, how could I take something ubiquitous, something every day, and change its reality? The other fascination that I had was with grafting. I grew up on a small dairy farm in Pennsylvania, and we were surrounded by cherry and peach orchards. And as a child, I was introduced to grafting, the idea of taking a branch off of one tree, cutting it and inserting it into another tree and watching it grow. As a child, this is the most magical thought in the world. It's Dr. Seuss, it's Frankenstein. And in the community that I grew up in, grafting is viewed with a, a sort of reverence. Um, and those that can do it, like my great-grandfather, were sort of praised for that ability. And for me, grafting, um, well, actually, I should go into the history of grafting a little bit. Grafting dates back 3,000 years. That's the earliest known um, examples of grafting. And the reason why trees are grafted is that the seed of a fruit tree will produce a genetic variant, so that when you plant that seed, that tree will have different characteristics than its parent tree. And so if you find a variety that you like, what you want to do is mimic it, and therefore you graft it onto a new root structure, it grows and you preserve it. So today, pretty much all fruit trees are grafted. But grafting is more than a process. Ovid's Metamorphosis, he uses grafting to speak of hybridity. Shakespeare uses it to speak of sexuality, and in the early, and it's probably for these reasons, in the early part of North America, as uh, religions would start to move here, it was considered sacrilegious. And it's for that reason that John Chapman was known as Johnny Appleseed as opposed to Johnny Apple grafting. <laughs> so, um, I start the tree of 40 fruit like a regular fruit tree. I take a small piece of what they call scion wood. That's wood that's harvested from a tree when it's dormant. I graft it onto a new root structure. After two to three years, what I'll do is I'll prune the tree, head it off so that it forms four to five scaffolding branches, branches, at which point I can start another grafting process known as budding. For budding, I go out in the middle of summer, 
I take what they call budwood. I select uh, sort of a foot-long section of this year's growth. I take a small sliver of it at the base of the leaf, including the bud. That small sliver is inserted into a like-size incision into the parent tree. It's taped. You let it sit for nine months. It heals in. The tree goes dormant. And in springtime, what you do is you, you prune it right above that grafting tape. And the tree is convinced, it's confused, it thinks that this is part, one of its actual growth buds, and it starts to form a new branch. And so this is what a tree of 40 fruit looks like when it's planted. Uh, it's been in the nursery for about five years. And then this is the year after. I go to visit each of the tree of 40 fruit that I place two times every year for a period of three years. I prune, I graft, I shape the tree until it looks something like this. Now, the number 40 is significant. Um, I started off with this. I was really ambitious when I started. I was like, I'm going to make a tree of 100 fruit. Um, but it was really an arbitrary number. And I came across the number 40 um, and found that it's used throughout all of Western religion. It's a number that's beyond counting. It's a multitude. And so the tree of 40 fruit. And so this is what a tree looks like at, as it has 40 graphs on it. This is an eight-year-old tree, and three or four years it'll look like the rendering that you first saw. Each of the tree has its own map. The tree is essentially designed. I realized when I started off that you could, since each of the different varieties that I was using had a different colored blossom, a different colored shape, or a different shape to it, that I could graft them onto the tree in such a way that you can cause it to blossom how you want it to. And when I started the project, I had several misconceptions, um, one of which was that this would only take two or three years, and that was eight years ago. Um, in addition to that, I thought it would be relatively easy to go out and find 40 types of stone fruits. Um, I live in New York, and in the 1920s, New York was the second leading producer of plums in the United States. So I started driving around. I would go from orchard to orchard, and I would only find two or three types of each of these varieties. It wasn't until I actually found a research, research orchard that I found that diversity that I was looking for. I found an orchard that had two to 300 heirloom and antique fruit varieties in them. And um, I was told that that orchard was the only and largest orchard of its kind east of the Rockies. The problem was is they were going to tear it out. And I wasn't sure what to do because I didn't have a lot of land. And then I realized that I could use the tree of 40 fruit and the process of grafting to collapse an entire orchard onto one tree to preserve these varieties. So when I first started this, I looked at preserving these heirloom and antique varieties as kind of like a novelty. But as this project has developed, I've come to see it as being rather critical. Whether, you know, I, I'm also ambivalent about genetic modification. One day I think that GMO is just another way or a more refined way of doing what we've been doing for 10,000 years. The next day, I wonder if producing more corn syrup is necessarily what we need to be doing to dump it into fast foods and into soft drinks. But whether you agree with the practice or not, it's here. And what we have to do is preserve the heirloom and antique varieties that these hybrid varieties are based upon. Because if the hybrid variety becomes threatened by disease or climate change, we'll find ourselves in the same place as we are with the Cavendish banana. And so these are plums that were harvested from one of the tree of 40 fruit in one week in August, which gives you the type of idea of the diversity that comes from them. And so there's numerous threats that I've found to these heirloom and antique varieties. I never imagined that I would be the plum guy, um, <laughs> but somehow I became the plum guy. <laughs> um, the first of these is industrialized agriculture. In the United States in 1945, 50% of the population had a direct tie to agriculture. Now that number is 2%. The small farm, like the one that I grew up on, they've, they're disappearing, or they've vanished. And in their place, 
Well, actually, and the thing with the small farms disappearing that's terrible is that they grow diverse crops. They grow just about everything. And in the place of those small farms is these monocultures that produce two to three different varieties of one or two crops. And what's really scary is that they don't even grow them for how the food tastes. They grow these foods for how well they ship, how well they store, their serving size, their color, their appearance, and finally, finally, it's an afterthought. Like the fifth or sixth thought to this is how it tastes. So when you go to the grocery store and you have a plum from a grocery store, it tastes bland and it tastes awful because it hasn't been allowed to ripen on the tree. So there's this guy I know, he's a grower in New York, and I was out looking, he had all these heirloom apricot trees, and I'm talking to him, and he's like, you know, this one, if you let it ripen on the tree, you're going to get lucky. And I was like, okay, I need to write, I'd graft that to a bunch of my trees now. Um, so these monocultures, something that's tied to these monocultures is disease management. So one of the greatest threats to these stone fruits is a virus called the plum pox virus, or PPV. It's not harmful to humans, but what it does is it create, creates malformed fruit, it stunts the growth of the tree, and gives the tree a shortened life expectancy. It's communicated by aphids and by grafting, and the big problem with it is that it's difficult to test for. A tree might be tested, and it might test negative the next year it might test positive. The disease is found in Europe, it's found in Canada, and in a dozen or so cases in the United States. In Europe and Canada, it's managed much like other viruses, uh, including the prune dwarfing virus. And what will happen is they'll cut down the tree and they'll immediately start testing the trees around it. But in the United States, the way that they approach it is that they, are, they come in, if a tree tests positive, they cut down the entire orchard set up a quarantine, you cannot plant a tree within that quarantine area, and you can't ship anything out of it. And what this is, is this is disease management that's designed for monocultures, and the effect that it's had on stone fruits, and in fact, the fruit growing industry has been tremendous. Growers won't plant fruit trees or stone fruit trees, uh, if they have stone fruit trees, they're looking to plant apples, and the last thing New York State needs is another apple tree. Um, or they're just not getting into it. A lot of people retire uh, after facing all of this. Additionally, um, you know, I myself, I, you know, many a sleepless nights thinking that a tiny little aphid could fly from a native tree to my orchard, and what'll happen is it wipes out these two to 300 different varieties of stone fruits that I'm preserving right now. The other thing is climate change. This year we had a day that went from, it was a day in April that went from 60 degrees to six degrees in a 12 hour period. It killed off all the fruit, and not only that, but it's killed off trees that growers have been growing for 20 to 30 years. In 1911, the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station published a book called The Plums of New York, which had up to, which listed the 2,000 or so varieties of just plums that were grown in the United States. Right now, you only have access to about 100 of those varieties. And so the aim of the Tree of 40 Fruit Project is to place them at sites and go out and find local samples, local heirloom varieties, whatever's left, and graft them onto the tree. In places like California, I can take these and graft, I can do an entire tree in California because there is something left of the industry. In a lot of cases, what this involves is pouring through 19th century agricultural manuals and reports, which I never thought I'd geek out on that, but it happens. Um, and so, in addition to preserving genetic diversity, I've also looked, come to look at the project as preserving culture. Um, as you can tell, I'm a fan of these origin stories. And I found out that culture, the Latin root of it, is cultivation and growth. And in addition to you know, preserving these varieties, what I'd like to preserve is the stories and the histories and the recipes that go along with these fruit varieties. Additionally, the taste. I have a plum that's 2,000 years old 
That means for 2,000 years, it's been grafted from one tree to the next, to the next, to the next. And it's amazing to taste a thing and think that people were having this like before Christ was born. So several years ago, I got a call from DARPA. I don't know if you know DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It's part of the Department of Defense. And when you get a call from them, your immediate reaction is, holy shit. <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, this is about the hoaxes again? Won't they let go of that? Um, but they actually wanted to talk about the tree of 40 fruit. And they said, you know, we think this in some way could address food security. So I went to Washington, um, and I spoke with them. And, you know, I, I said to him, the tree of 40 fruit is a way of preserving the varieties. It's not a way of addressing the issue of food security. And I should mention that food security has shown up on the Department of Defense's radar. They see it as a national threat because of the monocultures and the lack of diversity that we have in the fruits. And so I went home, and I'm thinking about this. How could we do this? And I thought, I'm going to blow the tree of 40 fruit back up, right? It started as an orchard. I brought it onto one tree to preserve it. Now's the time to blow it back up and create orchards. And so I came across this 16th century German term called Stropstweiss. And don't ask me to spell it. Um, and a Stropsweiss is a community-owned orchard, and it they started to appear in the 16th century around these small town cities and towns in Germany. They were community planted, community cared for, and community harvested. And as you can see, they weren't planted in the typical manner of an orchard. They were planted in a, as a meadow orchard. And so, borrowing this idea, the plan now is to create at least one, hopefully three of these orchards in the eastern part of the United States. Each orchard would have two to three hundred different heirloom and antique varieties, and this space would be a resource for local growers and individuals to come and taste the varieties. It would be a workshop where people could come and actually learn how to graft. And I view this as being accompanied by a book and a, sort of like a book that's based on the old 19th century albums of pomology, these hand-colored etchings. And it would also have descriptions of each of the fruit, how to grow them, recipes. A lot of these fruits have centuries-old recipes with them. In addition to that, it would have directions on how to graft, and then a step-by-step -step process on how to create your own tree of 40 fruit. Thank you. Bravo, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Sam, please tell us how many trees of 40 fruit are there today? Currently, there's 21, and they're at 17 different sites. And is that because you choose the different sites, or have people invited you? Yeah, generally somebody sponsors one of the trees, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, because it does, uh, it tends to get expensive because I'm traveling to the tree mm -hmm. seven, eight times. Although that said, the first trees that I planted, I still go back and visit over and over, so. And are they climate dependent? Like, could they grow in our climate here? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you have the fruit belt along the lakes. I mean, that's But how about in them. Toronto? How about in my backyard? Oh, all right. We're gonna need to talk later. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, can I have one? Yeah, we have to, see. well, actually, I can't ship you one because of uh, international regulations, sure. agricultural regulations. But you can come and visit, can, yeah. gather the components, yeah. begin we the process, yeah. and what? We need another 10 years, 15 years? Yeah. Fine. And you have to okay. harvest fruit. Okay. That's it. Deal. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. One more time. Okay. Oh, this okay. is a deal. We gotta get this it is the deal. deal. <laughs> okay, let's get that. Thanks tree. very much, Thank Sam. You. Yeah.